Hey there, friends. Uh, shout out to Earlham College in uh, Indiana. Richmond, Indiana. It's got a Purina factory. It used to be stand stand up pianos and uh, coffins were major exports, and I think of Richmond, and I think uh, maybe the pianos are still being made. I don't know. Coffins too, no doubt, but probably not as big a market. Uh, there's a lot to think about there. What I want to do is go through a different slideshow than usual. I'm always going through my one on dimension, the concept thereof, in synergetics, an important entry point to synergetics. Synergetics differentiate that from the Haken version. Uh, Fuller and Haken didn't work together. This was not a collaborative project, so where they ended up is quite different in terms of genre, I would say. The Haken one is more, if that's how you pronounce it, Haken, is more uh, like Springer Verlag, kind of a STEM subject. And what I want to talk about more is synergetics is more of a psychological subject, which is not evident when you first crack the covers, and I think why a lot of people run away screaming is it looks too forbidding. And in a sense of like a wall of ice, it's like all icebergs. To sail into synergetics, you open it and you look at it, it looks like you're coming into maybe a kind of a hostile environment, too cold. Let's talk about that some more in the light of Martian math or Martian mathematics, which I often uh, brand as like synergetics for kids, but that's kind of a dead end. Like Octavia Butler, Jim Henson, Walt Disney, they all fought that for kids stigma. Not there's anything wrong with kids. Actually, kids, I guess you have, well, what we'll do is we'll just say, Kids have more time to be deep, right? You get to be an adult, you're too busy anymore. So you become a shallow being, adult. Adults become adults. I'm not the first one to make that joke. All right. So I'm going to go through these slides. You're welcome to use them. I'll put the URL. I mean... I would use them in sequence and, right, teach what they're about teaching which is a kind of blend of math and science fiction, which we call Martian math, because as soon as we start talking about Mars, that's kind of licensed to let the imagination go wild in terms of what humans could eventually do there, but also just in terms of being in uh, a cosmos where we accept in principle that there are many life forms and we could also be visited. So the whole idea of opening other planets, it's a two-way street, and it just gets you into the right sort of mindset to, I don't know, brainstorm in a very big way about possibilities, right? So you need to use mathematics, I guess, to anchor your fantasies, right? And connect them and, and keep track of them and so forth. Mathematics we'll talk about, but you could think of it as kind of a crystalline core, and that's kind of an alchemical term. A crystalline core would be almost in a phase rule sense, as we will see. I'm going to make a little bit of a detour when we get to the phase rule, just to reassure you that we are kind of talking more about a psychology here, a faculty psychology maybe. Okay, so yes, we can get on this spectrum between dystopian and utopian. And here it's not like super simple. It's not like everyone even agrees what utopian, dystopian is or would be, right? It's not like, oh, we have these goals and we just fight over how to get them to them. Obviously, we probably all want to be in heading towards a better world. That's what we say, not towards a worse one. But you don't know about people. I think sometimes they're just drawn to the spectacle. They think if it's not going to hurt me, and if it's going to make better television, then let's have a good war of some kind, because I might actually get a better job. 
You know, that thought goes through a lot of people's minds. Um, and so you have to manage for that. So here's Bucky holding his module. I mean, uh, that looks like probably a kitchen. It just showed up in a container. And it's going to be unpacked. Oh, gosh, I don't know what that is exactly that he's got. But you can tell there's already a house inside. So I don't see that this would fit in there. I think this would become the contents. In other words, your dome is built separate, and then container shipping supplies the guts, maybe? That's science fiction, right? We don't actually have an industry based around all that I just showed you there. We can make fun of it, though. Here we're making fun of it, you could say, a bit of a parody. But again, the bigger theme is, do we go out into space or do we get visited by aliens or both, right? So we're going to talk, once you're in this big picture, though, like think about aliens and planets and solar systems and galaxies, then you're open to these big concepts, these broad brushstroke concepts. There's the Gibbs phase rule, okay? So just to give you a sense of how synergetics is psychological, he gets into the difference between the senses, right? So I'm talking like faculty psychology here, Thomas in a way. What are the internals of, you know, this is almost like getting back to like something in Sanskrit or something. We're talking about smell, listening. Okay, so it's very subjective. And it continues to be that, you know, visual versus tactile. And here it's important to insert a story from Fuller's own biography, autobiography, that he tells often, and I think it's on purpose, about he, he was nearly blind in the sense of nearsighted, uh, farsighted. Like he needed really thick corrective lenses once they discovered his problem. And from his point of view, he really got to know the world without good eyesight for like years. It was like he's like four years old or something before they diagnosed his vision issue, which is pretty intense. So suddenly he has glasses, and so this whole sharp vision thing uh, just intrudes upon him. And totally, it changes everything, you could say. His social relations, he can see expressions now. Whereas he'd been feeling, right? So he has a very strong dichotomy in this area, and I think it informs synergetics. But my purpose here is then to show you how he, in a scientific-looking way, in a literary way, though, nevertheless, he relates liquid, water, and vapor. Sorry, I should say solid liquid vapor, or you can see what I'm saying here on the screen. Uh, ice, water, median phase, and vapor, right? This is Gibbs territory. Gibbs phase rule is all about how if you change the temperature and pressure and given whatever chemical components, you have these pathways uh, of change. As you change the pressure, the response of the system is going to be that it goes undergoes various phase changes from liquid to ice and so on. But you can have multiple substances all doing this, right? And the result is more or less like an ecosystem. So I've got, you know, Mars, which partially frozen there, carbon dioxide, or that's like dry ice, right? So this is an amazing uh, drawing here of micro-micro stuff. And what happened is the platonic, so-called, people could imagine this stuff. They could visualize these kinds of things. And they seemed completely only in heaven, right? Like, my imagination must be connected to some uh, other dimension that I can imagine stuff like this. But then it turns out it's real, right? Right? This is actually occurring in nature. The virus and so forth, different Amazing geometry there. I'm just saying. Existence is not to sneeze at, right? The real world is not second banana to what we can imagine, is it? I think in, in synergetics we have a lot of respect for that which exists, not just that which we can imagine and think is better. 
Okay, uh, it gets into source code here. You'll notice I've sped up. I'm going quickly. Mostly, I just wanted to kind of get back to where psychology and natural philosophy com combine. I'm going back in time, right, to alchemy. You know, people were always trying to link astrology to the inner psyche, to states of mind, and the way you would get out of a blue funk or whatever you know, treat depression or whatever, was maybe not so profitable to the drug companies, although there have always been, like, mind-altering substances. But no, you have all of this internalized sort of proto-chemistry to think about, alchemy. You can psychologize about all kinds of stuff in ways we no longer maybe do or can, right? We, we're not as interior because we've lost a language of interiority. I'm not saying in general we have or all of us have, but if all you do is like watch police shows and buy stuff at Walmart, then do you have any room for a kind of a nuanced psychology, which would take you to being more like a whole planet yourself? Now, I've seen... Um, because you think in the round, for one thing, a system just has this topology. Think globally is not something you really have that much choice about. And it doesn't mean thinking globally, acting locally, doesn't really mean that you have to have a messiah complex. Because thinking globally, acting locally, is saving the world is more prosaic. Now that we have a save button and all this computer memory... You know, saving the world might just mean keeping a little scrapbook or being on Facebook and saving pictures, right? You're saving. You're curating the world there, see? It's not a, a heroic rescue of a damsel in distress from the jaws of a dragon, necessarily. There may be elements of that. You may have chapters like that, but thinking globally does not mean trying to be a saint, necessarily. It means you can't help but imagine yourself on a planet. And vis-a-vis -vis your relationship is to a planet. It's you and a ball. The campus, right? The campus. And now there's another campus over, over there, the Martian campus, where we have perseverance tooling about, very recently landed. This is what I call the concentric hierarchy, but is also called the cosmic hierarchy, very much a theme throughout this channel. It's a way of memorizing again, getting to stick together in kind of a logic, which means like logic we would put as ice, really. It's almost eccentric in the sense that you're not always trying to think all that um, rigidly. You know how we say rigor and rigid. We want to have rigor in our thinking. Logic, right? Crystal. We want that that kind of coming together kind of thing, right? The ice, right? But really it's fluid. That's fluency and fluid that's what we're going to call um, not eccentric, but kind of like where we want to be really. The median is water. And you can think of that as kind of a flexibility, but there's also a non-compressibility. Vapor, you know, when you're completely gaseous, it's kind of, maybe we could think of thought states that, um, um, you know, they're very malleable, open, and close to meaningless, you could say. It's like after, uh, in the aftermath of your having thought, having a system and it pops poop gone then you've got gas there that's the aftermath like when you laugh at a good joke or something I don't know I'm just reminding you that you can map all this kind of psychological terminology if you wish to synergetics and therefore have it be more of a grand central station that takes you to other works, right? It's not like you just stay in synergetics. It's like a merry-go-round. Jump on, spin around, jump off. 
go study cell biology for a while or something like that. That's the T and the E module, you could say. Back to bubbles, back to popping, back to modules, back to osmosis, back to mite, site, right, the whole third powering thing, how we can think different, basically. So Martian math, a combination of real world thinking, looking at the planet as a whole, brainstorming, and by adding like science fiction, you are liberating your mind, kind of like your Octavia Butler or something. And you're free to look at history then through the eyes of humans as terraformers, right? We are creating this world, still in the process of doing so. And here I show the terraforming of a local ecosystem to where it's now a hydro dam. What used to be the major fishing grounds for many different peoples, a convergent spot, was basically obliterated so that we could have the likes of electrical power and Google and so on. So, I'm not saying that was a good thing or a bad thing. It's not about moral judgments at every turn. You can get to those. Sometimes it's just taking in the information, right? So I'm, I'm just for completeness going to the end of the slides. I do get into graphing equations and all the conventional uh, material that you find in a math class. But then I go to volume and spatial geometry as well, which is often not done. Nowadays, we reserve like 10th grade for geometry and we don't get to the polyhedra in the back of the book very much. And then we'll get to vectors and so forth. But at that point, I don't know, we've lost the humanities by then. We've lost most of our imagination at some point along the way. Um, so we don't have a clear picture of, say, what you're looking at here, the CCP. So what the right brain workout that you get in synergetics is it restores your visual imagination, what we could call Eulerian, right? Which is opposite of Gibbsian, the visual the visionary, when you're thinking that way, then you're probably you're probably more in the Eulerian space, the way we think in. Uh, I need to update this slide maybe, but this, the whole idea of actually exploring Mars is part of this too. So again, a pretty long slideshow, right? You're wondering um, how far does it go, and I'll just tell you it's a uh, table of contents we're just finishing up here okay flash player blocked yeah now this was back in the old days when we could use flash all right we'll talk again and no homework yay